very natural. Yes. Thanks everyone for uh, coming. So hello everyone. Uh, I'm representing uh, group DevOps Malmo. My name is Karen, and that's man name in my country. Okay, so ignore <laughs> this fact. That's how it is. Good. So what we do is uh, we organize uh, meetups and. Uh, like we help people who wants to speak and etc. So we take all the overhead of like uh, organizing social media and etc. So if you are a cool company and you have cool speakers, so try to talk to me. All you need to do is just Google DevOps Malmo. So you will find we have pages in Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, meetup.com and github.com. So what we do is actually it's even much more easier than you think is uh, all you need to do is go to github page and create a pull request and if it's a good talk then we just approve this pull request and you are set to go that's all you need to do as simple as that so only one pull request will get you to have a nice speak and etc but again if you are a cool company think about Fukafe because today all is happening because of Fukafe, so they provide us a venue, pizza, and etc. So, one more time, big applause for Fukafe. <laughs> so, thank you very much, Fukafe, for all you do. And uh, I'm not going to take much more time. And uh, as you can see, when I speak, I put microphone right in front of my mouth. So, when you're going to ask a question, you should ask in the microphone and try to speak as I do. Okay? So. Next one uh, additional thing, so I'm going to take a pictures and if you do not want to be in social media, just raise your hand so I will put some celebrity face into your face. You don't want to be in social media. Cool. Anyone else? Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> I will just put a random uh, celebrity face. No, I'm joking. So it's And it's 100% fine. And if other group doesn't ask you for that, so please ask them, hey, I don't want to be in social media, and it's your right, OK? It's absolutely fine. Good. Thank you very much. So Karina, it's uh, all for you. So big applause. Thank you very much for presenting today. Again, very natural, Karen. <laughs> OK, hi, guys. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. I'm super honored. I really hope that I can give you a glimpse of what it can be being an engineer at IKEA, more specifically. Inca Group Digital, so that's where I am from. Uh, we provide the digital solutions cross-board for IKEA. Um, and so I really, want, I really want this to be for you. So please don't see this as a lecture, uh, but really do ask questions, maybe even challenge, if you find that some of this information isn't really quite the way you thought it was. Um, but anyway, my name is Karina Holberg. I've been with the Inca Group Digital for the past 10 years, actually, this year. So that's kind of insane, spending a whole decade. It went so fast. Uh, today, I hold the uh, title of DevOps engineer uh, for the past four years. I am officially part of two teams, uh, one being the one API that provides item uh, information uh, across platforms. So that would be CIA for short, Customer Item Availability, a great team that has really huge business impact, uh, of course. Um, and then we have the second team that is just as amazing. Uh, it's the sign up availability notification. So we provide the ability for you guys as customers at IKEA to kind of sign up for notifications just in case an item isn't available there and then. So those are the two kind of backend API uh, solutions that I'm a part of and uh, super, super grateful to be part of them because they are just, you know, kick ass. Um, let's see here. So what I'm hoping to convey today is basically the, the journey that has been done for the past 10 years, what I've seen uh, and some takeaways of that. So 10 years now, a lot has happened. Um, and that has all to do with engineering maturity. So it kind of really has a deep impact in how I perceive engineering maturity. Uh, understanding the uh, evolution of collaboration, uh, hopefully the examples that I will give you from real life solutions that have been running uh, in, in our company, how the collaboration has really changed everything that we do. 
And then, of course, for all of you guys that are looking into maybe actually joining uh, our big family, uh, a sneak a peek of what it can mean to be an engineer uh, for IKEA. And of course, it's subjective. It's just my perspective and, of course, my experience. It can be very different, but I hope it will be positive. Uh, by the end of the presentation, we will actually have a QR code. Uh, Karim, you've tested it, so it, it is working. Uh, basically, I'm just asking for your feedback because standing here, just kind of talking about what I've done and you know, if it's not worthy your time, I definitely would like to know that. Uh, but at the end of the feedback, there's an option if you guys want to connect through LinkedIn. I've already had a couple of guys come here and talk, say, hey, I see my future at IKEA, which is great. Uh, just connect to LinkedIn and we can kind of try to figure out what area, what kind of steps you kind of need to do to kind of onboard. So that would be lovely because, you know, we are expanding and we totally need new competence to, you know, provide us going forward, really, at our company. So that's what I hope I can give you. Uh, but any expectations that you guys have, please just let me know so you don't go from here saying, you know, what a waste of time. That would be a shame. Uh, okay, so let's see here. So what I'm going to share with you guys is kind of the journey that, that I've experienced. So I'm going to start with the initiatives that IKEA did looking at cloud providers. So I was actually part of the very first initiative to kind of review what it would mean for us to going on-prem solutions uh, to a cloud provider. So I will actually show some of the uh, white paper uh, that we had and some of the contributions done for that pilot that ran for six months. And that was actually reviewing Azure Infrastructure as a Service, which is so funny. There are some limitations that we noted back in the day. This is 2013, 14. Uh, and the limitations, which is so funny to look at today because, of course, the portal does not look the same as it did back then. But that was some of the findings that we did. And then we're going to look at uh, legacy systems that have uh, limitations within the organization. So, of course, as you guys know, consumers really want a lot of features and it should be fast. Of course, how else would you actually survive? Uh, but then we saw that, you know, we had fragmented systems, very old technology, how could we ever grow? Uh, and most of the solutions back in the day, they were really attached to the network. So if you wanted different concept stores, uh, you really couldn't uh, push any uh, solutions towards them because they needed to be hooked to our network. And of course, that's not feasible uh, in the long run. So you will see actually some actual code from one of the solutions that I was um, responsible for um, as a product specialist. I did the implementation and development of it. Uh, kiosks, so lockdown clients uh, for um, customers. And then I'm going to end with how it looks today. So now we have Greenfield projects uh, running on cloud providers. So I'm actually going to show a little bit of, uh, of code. Of course, not proprietary, <laughs> but uh, it will give you hopefully some insights to how the journey is today and what differences that entail. And hopefully it will kind of spring some, you know, hope <laughs> for the future. Um, okay, cool. So I hope I can do that. The very first um, steps towards kind of reviewing what you know, a cloud solution would entail for our company was done through a pilot. And that pilot was called Run Oracle on Azure. <laughs> and uh, this was back in the day when the portal was super static. Um, I was actually still a, a student uh, back then. Um, so what I did was uh, I was, uh, they agreed to actually let the uh, pilot and the outcome be a part of my exams. So my final kind of paper is a part of that. So that's why it's okay for me to show it to you because I got the approval. Um, but that journey was so funny. They had three external recruitments. I was one of them and everyone else had been part of IKEA for like 10 plus years. Uh, and the whole goal was, uh, number one, look at the um, IT landscape and try to identify a product that has least dependencies. So it'll be pretty easy to kind of try it out without any business critical impact, of course. So we did find, back in the day, we had a solution called Business Information for Food. Um, and at that point in time, they were a part of uh, Inca. 
Um, and so they had the least dependencies, or actually none uh, of the dependencies, and we basically took their database and tried it out, and we tried the uh, infrastructure as a service. And I know there's a lot of text, and I'm not expecting you guys to read it, but what this is is, you know, some of the considerations that we needed to take into, you know, uh, consi uh, to consider before moving anything that we had on-prem to a portal. So one of the limitations was, of course, Microsoft did do their updates, which could potentially at that time kind of rewrite everything we did, which wasn't feasible, right? And there was some, you know, the, the portal wasn't really workable. Uh, I don't remember we ever had, you know, a development type of um, integration with the system back in the day. So that's actually pretty funny to kind of look through and see the limitations. You will, of course, not see the same limitations today. Thank God. <laughs> but that was the first initial steps. And of course, so much has happened since. And it's been really, really interesting to be part of, of the journey and seeing how the organization changed over time. I was very fortunate to be doing this as well as being a part of the super awesome team. We, we were called the Windows team because we did all of the, the Windows environment and servers and you know, 100,000 clients. Um, so I actually got a really great background into the, the company. People have been working there for 10 plus years, so I learned so much. Really grateful. Second one, oh yeah, this is, uh, this is just a little bit of how the kiosk looks. But we get back to that because I can't play it in uh, display mode. It isn't good. But I'll come back and you guys can see uh, a little preview of it. Oh yeah, and I was going to show a code snippet from this. Um, so because kiosk was running on a Windows environment, we had a lot of constraints. Uh, we were working with uh, PowerShell, of course, to kind of run our scripts and do the deployments. Um, but what we didn't have, and now I'm kind of outing <laughs> my group, at least back in the day, we didn't have, you know, revisions for our code commits. We did them. It's so silly. I'm going to show it to you because I want you to laugh with me. <laughs> it doesn't look the same nowadays, I promise. Um, but, but, but. Yes, so, you know, we didn't have a repository for our code. It was literally creating uh, folders and different hierarchies. Uh, so let's see, here. can I make this a really big? So if you guys look, this is how we kept track. Oh, you can't see it? Because it's on, uh, can I do? Yeah, that's what I can do. Okay, very cool. Uh, let me just do that, okay. So what I, oh, okay, then I need to do this. <laughs> this, this is uh, our version, versioning <laughs> for the, the packages that we created. So, you know, you kind of added the, the different changes. This was our good history <laughs> back in the day. Of course, not scalable, um, but I thought it would be funny to kind of show. And all of this is kind of PowerShell for the old kiosk. When, when we began the migration from Windows 7 to Windows 10, so everything is, you know, the logic for in which context the client should actually boot on and all of the different, you know, reg keys were kind of dispatched there. But I thought it was funny to see how long, how far we've come now with the uh, versioning and the semantics and just keeping track of things. And um, these types of old solutions, they had all, uh, they had to be compiled in packages. So when uh, Microsoft came out with this, uh, they had something called, uh, you know, a lockdown client based on UVPs. So everything we did had to be compiled for us into those specific packages. It was not a fast process, and our deployment back then was like four or five times a year. <laughs> you know, you know, stuff has happened since, but well, now you've seen a little bit of what it used to be, and there was a lot of politics also when you needed to kind of you know apply for making something compiled and packages. The process was super long. It was not our best <laughs> back in the day. Let's see here. So next, um, so now you just saw, uh, you know, the steps into cloud, and now you've seen the legacy. Uh, what I'm going to show now is how far have we actually come 
Well, when we started 2013, it was like, oh, this is going to be such a hassle, right? All of the work and how are we going to do this? But there was even cultural kind of aspects to it. How do you go from all of those handovers between different sections of the organization um, and create you know, nice product teams? You don't create A and B teams. How can we kind of sustain uh, the life cycle of, of a product full on? And of course, that had everything to do with collaboration, fostering and cultivating collaboration throughout the organization. Um, and I should also say that, you know, not too long ago, digitalization wasn't seen as, you know, a part of the solution or even the driver for solutions. It was only seen as a cost. So that was very different. Um, so now, of course, we are seen as not only part of the solution, but also you know, the innovative side of things, uh, the way forward. So for us that works as engineers, that is so very motivating. So it's day and night for sure. Um, so it took, it took a couple of years until we actually got there, but uh, what we did was we did like soft transitions from big legacy systems towards cloud and of course it was a try and error period there for about two years. Um, I'm so happy to say that both our products here are, um, uh, my colleague is sitting in the, <laughs> that's why I'm pointing, uh, both of my product teams are Greenfield projects running on uh, GCP. Um, and so it allows us to have uh, anatomy. Um, what I mean is we really own the full scope for the products. So anything that needs to be delivered is delivered in the DevOps uh, type of setup uh, and mind. So we do not have, you know, once, twice or five times type of deployment. Of course not. Uh, we do continuous improvement, continuous deployment, uh, which is so great. And of course we can make good changes faster because now we don't have that dependency towards you know, specific network and we can scale, uh, which is very nice. And of course, no handovers. So <laughs> that frees up a lot of time, uh, which we are all very grateful for. So what I'm going to show now is a little bit of the implementation for one of our services, which is the uh, Backend API CIA for how we um, kind of go about today in, uh, in creating uh, our solutions and implementations. And so what you're going to see is a little bit of Terraform because that's what we use, uh, infrastructure as uh, code. Um, so we want everything kind of codified, really. We want to work with declarative type of configurations because it can be reproduced. Um, back in the day, you will see in the video, once I get back to it, how I used to do my tests for kiosks, uh, which is also laughable, <laughs> but it was true. <coughs> and we have the perfect kind of setup with test and stage and production. So we are following all of those, you know, frameworks uh, for agility, which is super, super cool. Um, okay, so let me show you a little bit of how we implement those. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so our choice, uh, now GCP has their own uh, kind of deployment manager for kind of driving uh, code uh, in infrastructure, but we find that Terraform works really, really well for us. So basically what this is, you're using, you're using um, their services to kind of call the APIs. So this is kind of a, a screenshot of how our infrastructure can look like. So if you haven't kind of dived into that, I will definitely say it. It's so much fun and very easy to understand. Um, so any type of uh, settings that you need, or it can be like permissions and roles, it can be adding team members, you do not want click ops. You know, uh, I used to do configuration through a UI and it's not great. <laughs> so Terraform, absolutely, uh, and then uh, what I wanted to show you was just a little sneak peek into, no, 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 no. Okay, it's because I can see. I can see you. Okay, I'll do this. Where are you? Okay. Ah. 
So what this is and why I wanted to show it is I'm a DevOps engineer, and that can mean different things depending on which team you're in, uh, which company you're in. Um, and what I would like to kind of emphasize is that you can have different starts. Uh, but I think what I would say is the big thing about being a DevOps engineer is you know, the mindset and how you apply all you know and kind of all of your knowledge into this role. And of course, you have the mindset and the practices. They are important. Um, and so what I wanted to show with this little snippet of code and the Terraform is that you have this broad spectrum of you know, technicalities, uh, stacks, that is a part of what we do, which is, of course, for any type of software engineer. But I think it's the way you approach things uh, and how you utilize your knowledge since before. Um, so this is just to give you like a, a brief insight in what type of requirements um, a DevOps engineer, specifically me, because all of these are, are my implementations specifically. Um, so it's a really bad spectrum of, you know, what are you kind of asked to do? Uh, but again, it's a flexible role too, because depending on which team you come into, they have different needs. But it's not exclusively you that do things. You might drive certain things. You might have a depth into a cloud provider's best practice. That's super great. But you definitely need to be an intricate part of the team and contribute in a lot of aspects. And most of the things that I do is very kind of sharing knowledge. Uh, for certain uh, areas that I, of course, have more depth in. Uh, your team needs to have all of the knowledge that you can apply as a DevOps engineer, just as well as you need to take that knowledge from your team members. And that's kind of how you cultivate that collaboration and, and culture, both within your teams, but cross-function. And I think that that's kind of the heart of uh, DevOps, I would say, for me. Um, uh, and this little closeness is just, you know, from, you know, you have to apply perhaps a function <laughs> of sorts. You have to be able to do that too. Uh, a lot of the things I've done have been security-wise, setting up GCP in the correct uh, manners for more than just my two teams. Uh, but of course, that will vary from, from DevOps engineer to DevOps engineer. Um, yeah, guys, so, so this is a little bit of how it looks today, having your solution in cloud. So you've seen the first steps IKEA did, legacy systems, <laughs> and uh, now cloud. So I mean, that's kind of 10 years <laughs> in a nutshell. Um, so I guess that that's my presentation. I hope it made it worth your while and, and get that you know, view of what is being an engineer at you know, Inca Group Digital, which it is, of course. Uh, and I'm so very grateful to stand here and kind of share some of my company's uh, great steps <laughs> forward. <laughs> so now it's kind of up to, to you guys if you want to see anything specific or ask any specific questions. Um, yes, Manel. <laughs> uh, wait. Uh? So you mentioned that IKEA used to see digital solutions as a cost of doing business. What do you think was the wake-up call to see them as a driver for business instead? Was it just Corona came and we can't sell in the stores, or uh, <laughs> what was it? No, the realization came way before uh, COVID. <laughs> thank God, uh, it was definitely the the scale of things. Like we could not output, um, you know, solutions, uh, better options, and features towards our customers, and that piled up. And of course, uh, each handover and processes were taking over you know, uh, th the main core objective, which is, of course, to uh, create value for the organization. And then, of course, thank God, they realized that digitalization was an enabler and, and not just a cost. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> putting that into the value, being digitalization, uh, made a huge difference for us. So, of course, having fragmented solutions, old technology, and of course, a resistance to change, because what would that actually mean? Kind of having to, uh, people kind of had to relearn, people who've been at the company for a very long time, and there's always a resistance to change, right? But that kind of faded away pretty quickly when we saw how much it could enable us. Uh, so, uh, thank God it did. So, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Any other? Yeah. Again? Yeah. I'm so sorry. So the first question that was uh, given to us was, you know, how did the realization of digitalization from just being a cost to actually be an enabler came about? Um, and so that was the, the answer, previous answer. And then the next question was, I've shown how it used to look like and what it is now. How do I perceive uh, the future? <clears throat> well, I think we kind of just started our journey, really. Uh, we are learning from the seniority of the Greenfields project still to this day. Uh, and what I'm hoping to see is uh, the, the engineers, the, the product teams, having more say into what they believe they can actually contribute with. Uh, I think we still have kind of a system where you know, you get input from consumers and customers, and then you're creating this huge backlog. But way too seldom do we actually ask the engineers what they perceive would be beneficial, uh, both for the company and a customer value. And I think it has to be more internally, because the engineers are the expert for each solution. So I really do hope that <coughs> the organization kind of start um, you know, supporting us. And that's us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I would love to do more VR stuff, but <laughs> yeah, so one thing at a time. I'm close enough, so, but it's probably not going to catch the... Uh, yeah, no, so then uh, you just ask question and... Yeah, I will ask question. Yeah. I'll try to be loud enough. Yeah. So yeah. I, I just start, you started with um, just telling that there was, a, there was a project like 10 years ago, you said, like... Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Well, pilot. In various cloud providers. Yes. Uh, and they kind of jumped onto us. Can you, tell, can you tell a bit more about this, like how did it go? And, you were like really part of that? Or yes, yes, yeah. I, I, I was a member of that team. I think we were two handfuls of people, three <laughs> external uh, recruited, and I was one of them. Um, so how- CCP is kind of dominating in IT, right? So yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yes. Um, so when we did this, it was Azure uh, for the pilot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so kind of looking through the IT landscape to try and identify a solution that didn't have enough dependencies uh, was a lot of fun. And they kind of sent me the rookie <laughs> that still hadn't kind of learned how the organization was set up to kind of set up the uh, communication because the solution was not part of the uh, technical side of things. And there was a lot of, you know, blockers. Uh, so that was a very humane experience, first of all, to kind of ask a product to be part of this because it required their time, and you guys know there, there's priorities in each and every product team. But then when we really got a good communication going and they said yes, and it didn't take long because we kind of explained what we were trying to achieve, and of course we were trying to see what value uh, this cloud provider could enable us with. Um, and then just like you said, IKEA has tried out a lot and come to certain conclusions and then that can always be revised. Um, but also to really look into the uh, limitations and how we should, because there a lot of people that are not technical think that being cloud native is just a shift left, like you take what you have and you encapsulate that with a VM that's not cloud native. <coughs> it requires a lot of work and uh, you should actually utilize the capacity of the cloud provider to be able to scale, to take advantage of all those things. And that whole process was, uh, it required a lot from all of the organization, uh, really. Um, but it was kind of an input in, so if we wanted to take advantage of that, we cannot just encapsulate and use what we have. And I think most companies come to the same conclusion. No, no problem. No. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it's working. Come on, man. It's like uh, it has to be in the, the in the right touch. hands, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Good. So question is like, uh, because we spoke about like, hey, old technology, now uh, infrastructure as code and Google Cloud, cloud technologies. What do you see uh, this technology going five years? Have you considered being multi-cloud or hybrid cloud mm. or multi and hybrid cloud? Mm. So what is your journey? So what do you think you are going through? Yeah. So again, I can't speak for the full organization, but all I can say is I'm happy you asked the question <coughs> because that has a lot to do with disaster recovery planning, which is my baby today. <laughs> Kiosk was one once upon a time. Um, so what it is is uh, you have a business expectation. Uh, uh, you have an expectation from business in your solution, which defines what type of criticality it has if it's down. And so we as a team, we need to kind of look at that expectation and see how we can match it. And usually that is done through service level agreements and, and SLOs. But it has been a really fun journey discussing with the team as how we perceive our solution and how we should communicate criticality. And of course, you cannot do a failover for a full product to start. You want to do that in iterations. Um, and so what we are doing is we're looking at, you know, you have the industry expectations of a disaster, of course, you, you can check it out in Google, but what does that mean for our organization? And so you have to take that in small steps. And so being, having a failover from provider to provider is of course, you know, the end goal of security, but it might not always be, you know, a good, solution and of course if your solution does not have business impact why would you spend that money uh, so if you have a hot failover that automatically says money and so you always have to kind of balance the value it adds uh, to say yes or no to which type of failover you choose and the failover we kind of define if you are multi-cloud or have that failover between cloud providers um, and again, disaster recovery is a maturity of where your organization is at. So, you know, I think that there is definitely a plan to super secure everything and have, you know, that, but it should not be done without a thought process. And that goes from product to product. So I believe that my organization and how I understand it is of course, your team have to understand how it impacts uh, the organization. And then you create a foundation and an argument to say this is how our failover looks and this is what we need. And so there are no blockers for us to have, you know, a cloud to cloud failover, but can you actually have an argument towards the cost that that implies? And then of course you have the discussion of should I be cloud agnostic or just utilize, you know, cloud nativeness? Um, there was this kind of golden path where everything should be portable, right? You should not use these specific uh, cloud providers because then it will be, but that is not reality always and you might not be able to utilize the cloud provider in the best intended way because of course you have the service promise uh, and if you don't follow their setup, you will not achieve that service promise and that will have an impact. So don't make things more complicated than it should be, but have the argument for your choices. And that's the best way I can answer the question. Um, my next question will be, uh, because you also have a journey of choosing infrastructure as code. So that was the pilot for reviewing that specific service. Okay. I'm glad to say that today we totally focus on, you know, microservices, serviceless, and fully managed services, because of course we want to focus on what's really important. Um, and at least I don't know any solution that can actually look and say, we really do need that full control for the full stack, because it requires time, right? Um, so for my product, fully managed, uh, you know, any type of service for, for GCP is the prone one. <laughs> so not We're having some mic issues for you guys at home. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's dead, finally. Uh, so then uh, the question is like, because you have evaluated the cloud, you have to choose the cloud that is fitting or whatever. Uh, when you did the evaluation of Terraform or if you did, mm. have you considered other options like Postman, Config Connector? 
So I don't think we're unique uh, in this specific case, but we have kind of a tech radar, of course, with the recommended baseline for what type of you know uh, technologies uh, we support, and then there is always the you know try it out and see if it works. Um, and so, depending on your team, you are absolutely free to choose what you choose, uh, what you want to choose. Um, so when it comes to your question, I know there are other units that are looking to other options and there are probably more MVPs to try and figure out what would be more suitable. Um, and then we create baselines, but again, your product team knows your product best and you kind of create your culture and your baseline. So it would be kind of weird saying you have to, <laughs> today at least. It would be weird to hear that. I cannot confirm or deny. <laughs> I cannot. But I do, I can definitely say that uh, the mission is absolutely to modernize the full landscape, but IKEA is huge. And there is uh, many, many solutions to modernize, like most companies, like most big companies. So, yeah. <laughs> One slice per question, is that yeah. it? Okay, <laughs> there's a lot of hungry people yeah. in the audience. We allow you to go even earlier than the rest of the audience. <laughs> oh. The oh. oh, yeah. But, but guys, uh, if you please uh, provide some feedback, if you want to connect through LinkedIn, if you figure out questions after the fact, I'm definitely approachable. So go ahead uh, and do that. And I thank you so much for your time for spending this time here with me. That's cool. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.